telegraph and telephone communication so vital in today's army requires the installation of a network of wire lines. These are either surface lines or overhead lines. The overhead type is difficult to construct and is readily broken by small arms and artillery fire. Most field wire lines are temporary and are needed quickly, so surface lines are laid with the least possible special construction. The wire used must be easy to handle. It must be able to withstand flexing and strain and still have enough electrical conductivity for field use. It must be moisture proof. It must be protected from crushing. Here is the standard field wire W110B. The wire consists of two conductors which are twisted together. In each conductor there are three strands of copper. These afford the electrical conductivity. And there are four of steel. These provide the tensile strength. The strands are covered by a rubber compound. This protects them from moisture and the danger of shorting the circuit. Over all this there is a braid. It protects the wire and rubber from the abrasion of rocks and crushing by troops or vehicles. W110B wire is issued on type DR4 drums in half mile lengths and on type DR5 drums in mile lengths. The weight is about 130 pounds a mile. These drums are designed for use with special equipment which eliminates the necessity of transferring the wire to new drums. The talking range of this wire under average conditions is between 11 and 17 miles. Here is another type of wire, W130. It has a talking range of only 7 to 10 miles. Because it is easy to handle, it is used by the infantry where lines are going to be shorter and more temporary. For instance, between an observation post and an 81 millimeter mortar. Each conductor has six steel strands and one of copper. It is covered by a thin rubber insulation. The same wire also comes with braid. It is known as W150 and weighs 50 pounds to the mile. In laying field wire, the first thing that a crew member must learn is how to splice wire. The field wire splice is most important. It is used for tying two circuits together. The splice can easily be made by one man, but time can be saved if it is done by two men working as a team. For uniformity, each man measures back six inches or the length of his pliers on one of the wires and cuts it off. With the heel of his pliers, each soldier crushes the insulation on the long wire, starting opposite the end of the short wire. He crushes for about four inches. Next, he measures a plier's length down the short wire and crushes as before. Then, with the cutting edges of the pliers, he scores the insulation about half an inch above where the crushing began. Changing his grip on the pliers, 
he strips back the crushed insulation by pulling the pliers straight along the wire. Note the half inch of crushed insulation left here. The remaining insulation holds the strands together, making the wire easier to handle and preventing possible injury from the steel strands. If the strands are dirty, they can be scraped with the edge of the pliers. He prepares the short wire the same way. Each member prepares his wire in the same manner in order to get a uniform stagger. The long end of one circuit splices to the short end of the other. This prevents all the strain being on one conductor. For clearer illustration, the splicing of only one conductor will be shown. When two men work as a team, both conductors of the wires are spliced at the same time. Using a square knot, the wires are tied together. The square knot is demonstrated with rope for the sake of clarity. Left over right for the first loop, left under right for the second. If the second loop is made improperly, a granny knot will result. Remember, left over right for the first, left under right for the second. With wire, the tie is made so that about one quarter inch of bare wire is left between the knot and the insulation. The electrical conductivity of the splice is improved by using seizing wire. The seizing wire is a strand of copper about six inches long. It is passed through the knot and doubled over. Then the knot is pulled tight. Half of the seizing wire is wrapped to one side of the knot, half to the other. After two or three turns, the knot will be bound so that the excess wire can be cut off flush with the insulation. The outer braid of the wire is peeled back from the half inch that was crushed, but not skinned. This leaves exposed rubber insulation to permit close adhesion of the rubber tape. A close-up shows clearly the three turns of seizing wire. The wire cut off flush with the insulation. And a half inch of braid peeled back. Wrapping is then continued until two turns are taken on the insulation. The end of the seizing wire is cut off and the sharp edge is pressed into the rubber. 
Then the other side is completed in a similar manner. Here's a close-up that shows the two turns taken on the insulation. Notice that the sharp ends of the wire are pressed into the rubber. While this splice was being made, the other lineman has retwisted the wire and spliced the other conductor the same way. This shows the six inch stagger in the splice. The splice is covered with rubber tape to give added insulation resistance. About four inches of tape is used. The soldier starts the tape at the center, stretching it as he goes. He works to the braid on one side and then across to the other side and back to the center again. The same procedure is followed with friction tape, which is extended an inch beyond the rubber tape. Normally, when two men are working together, one man holds the wire while the other handles the tape. Here's the completed splice. The splice for the lighter W130 wire is somewhat different from the regular field splice. The procedure at first is the same. Three inches of insulation are cleared from each of the conductors, starting six inches from the end of each wire. Conductors are tied with a square knot. The ends are crossed over the knot. They are then wrapped around the wire until two or three turns have been taken on the insulation. The excess wires are cut off and the edges pressed into the rubber. The close-up shows the turns taken on the rubber and the ends pressed down. The wire is retwisted and the other conductor spliced. The completed splice is wrapped with rubber and friction tape as with the regular field splice. This method for improving the electrical conductivity of a splice can be used with a heavier wire when there is no seizing wire available. Only the copper strands are used. 
they can be distinguished from the steel strands by their greater flexibility. They are removed from the short ends. Then these copper strands are crossed over the knot and the splice is finished as before. This is the completed splice before taping. It is frequently necessary to splice a wire into an established circuit without interrupting communication. In this case, the T-splice is used. An inch and a half of insulation is removed from the conductors of the original circuit. These spaces should be a foot or more apart. The wires are then laid out in this way, and one of the conductors of the new line is cut off opposite the first bared place. The ends of the new circuit are prepared as when making an ordinary field splice. The wires are then tied in with square knots. For clarity's sake, the knot is demonstrated with rope. A loop is formed in the continuous line. The end of the new line is passed up through the loop, around behind, and down through again. Sometimes the old line is to be cut away, like this. Notice that the two short ends are on the same side of the knot. This is a true square knot. When strain is applied, it tightens and holds. The knot is made again. This time the end is passed around the other way. <laughs> 